my pleasure to introduce the director, Julius Ona, and Kelvin Harrison, Jr. <laughs> Hello. Hey. As I mentioned before, this is uh, extraordinary, extraordinary, and there's a lot of issues being discussed, but this was personal for you when you decided to take it. Can you explain why? Uh, first of all, though, thank you all for coming out tonight. I mean, it's just so heartening to see an audience here supporting an independent film, so thank you so, so much for coming. Um, the play I read back in 2014, um, and you know, my reaction at the end of it was, holy fuck. Um, <laughs> Um, and JC, who wrote the play, who's a brilliant, brilliant dude and brilliant writer, it felt like he was kind of peering into my head. I was born in Nigeria, moved to America when I was 10 years old, um, and many of the uh, issues of identity in the story were ones that were very personal to me, and they were also very personal to JC as well. He's uh, biracial, part Asian, part black, part white. Um, so for both of us, that idea of moving through your life with different masks and having different expectations placed upon you depending on the context you were in and, and having to code switch and adjust in all those different ways uh, were things that you know we very intimately knew and, and, and had grappled with. So um, the minute I was done reading the play, the second I said I wanted to turn it into a movie. And Kelvin, you know, Luce is like a chameleon in this film. You don't know, you know where he's going. Uh, if he's acting or if he's just oblivious to what's going on in his world, how would you best describe his situation? Ooh. Yeah, he's uh, he's doing a lot of he's very he's very performative. Um, I think he, he he does what he needs to survive. At the end of the day, he's kind of coming to the situation that isn't necessarily looking out for his best interests, and he kind of has to do it on his own. So, um, I, I think Luce is trying to to get get him make himself heard in the best way possible, in the way that, um, in a way that. How do I describe it? it? That may not be the most sweet, <laughs> 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 but it's necessary. Yeah. You know, when you put this together uh, and adapting it, you know, what changed from the stage? Um, well, the great thing about the play is it already had the architecture of a thriller to it. Um, but you know, a play is very confined. Um, there were only two locations: the school and the house, and there were only five characters. It was just mom, dad, loose the teacher, um, and Stephanie Kim, the girlfriend. So it was really important to expand it, you know, it, it, what I call um, horizontally and vertically. So uh, horizontally in terms of more plot, and then vertically in terms of taking the core themes and, and expanding them in a way that could really fill the cinema. Um, so, uh, uh, and also, you know, it, you see a lot of adaptations of plays to film, and like my horror would, it, would, it, would, would be it feeling like, oh, we just got a bunch of actors and turned on the camera. And it was really important that it was created in a way that you take full advantage of what you can do with a movie in terms of close-ups and movement and, um, and then also music. And, and you know, we shot the movie on 35 on film. So there were a lot of things I tried to do to really take advantage of the fact that it should be a cinematic piece. Um, but the core ideas and questions, um, uh, the ambiguity and the complexity of the play were things I really wanted to honor with the film. You know, when you look at Luce and you look at how he interacts with his parents, how he, inter how he interacts with his friends, and then his teachers, and he's totally different with each one of them. And I think a lot of people can relate to that in some different ways, depending on where the environment that they're coming out of. For you, when you read the script, you know, how did you work with Julius in terms of how to interpret that character? Um, it started off, hey. <laughs> um, it started off with, I mean, I had a lot of questions and I had my own experiences. Like I went to a private school in New Orleans and like uh, the first thing that they told me when I got there was like, we say yes, not yeah. Because I was like, you know, and I was like, yeah, what's up, yeah. And they were just like, no. And so <laughs> that was like, I was like, okay, I, I'm not, I feel like I speak poorly and I don't really know what, you know, I feel, I felt a little ashamed of myself, so I have to adjust. And then they were like, well, C is good for Kelvin. So it was all these things, like, what do your parents do? I was like, I've never had to think about these types of things. So like the conversation with Julius was like, I immediately, started to learn in, in high school was like how to how do I assimilate to the culture that they've already set for me in this, you know, mostly white um, private school in New Orleans. And so that was kind of the we just took that and we kind of went and I knew how to code switch. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You've got a phenomenal cast to hear you talk about Tavia, Naomi, Kelvin, uh, Robert, you know, how did you put this together? Um we got really lucky. 
Um, but no, it started um, with a script and a lot of time and care put into constructing the script, but then the first person that we went to uh, was Octavia. Um, and I was like, she's, no way she's gonna do this. No way, why, the hell, why would she wanna work with me? Um, luckily, uh, JC was working on a TV thing that um, he had been talking to her agent and her about, um, and uh, they sent the script over to her agent, and her agent emailed back, just exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Um, and then I had a conversation with Octavia, um, and I was nervous as hell. Uh, and she just says, Julius, I know this woman. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, when Octavia tells you that, there's not much more to say. So then I started making up things to say so I wouldn't sound like a total idiot. Um, but um, she just had a very clear understanding of who this character was. And when she came on board, it validated the project. Um, Naomi was somebody who I fell in love with when I saw Mulholland Drive uh, when I was back in undergrad. And it was just like, Jesus Christ, I got to work with this woman someday. So in the writing process, the I wrote the first draft of the script. JC came, did a second draft, and we went back and forth. But from that first draft, she was who I actually was writing in mind of. And uh, we were very fortunate um, that Octavia and Naomi had done um, a movie kind of like this one called The Virgin. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's nothing like this. Uh, um, um, so they had uh, a prior relationship, but Naomi read it. I did a Skype with her. She got it on the first bounce, what we were trying to do with this movie, and she's not somebody who shies away from risky material. Um, and then she had done a little movie with Tim Roth called Funny Games. Um, uh, and uh, I kind of laughed when the Tim conversation came up because there's sort of a set of funny games happening in this movie as well between one generation of people and another generation of people. Um, so that's kind of how it came together. I mean, the trickiest one was finding a loose because, you know, there's list of actors you could go to for these other roles. There's no list of like, okay, who can pull off a 17-year-old Eritrean former child soldier who happens to be a champion debater? Um, uh, at least I didn't know what that list was. And, um, and in fact, when I first met Calvin, we had this breakfast uh, at La Brea Bakery, in, 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 and I was like, yeah, no way this guy's gonna be in the movie. He was, he, he came, you know, you can see him, he's such a sweet, thoughtful, kind uh, human being. Um, and then he was asking all these questions, and it seemed like he was confused. like just a total space cadet. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, nice to meet him. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and then a couple weeks later, this tape comes in, and yet again, it was another holy fuck moment, because Cal Calvin outsmarted me. He totally got all the answers he needed without making it seem like he was doing that, and he just nailed the audition. And in fact, I because, loosed him. <laughs> you loosed him. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, one of the things that uh, encouraged Naomi to come on board was she found a way to get the tape. And I was like, I'm talking to her, and she's like, yeah, so I saw Kelvin's audition. I'm like, how did you see Kelvin's audition? It doesn't matter how I saw Kelvin's audition. But I was never going to do this movie if I didn't have a scene partner. And that speaks volumes to what this, what, 22, 23-year-old managed to pull off. You know, there's a lot of themes in this movie, and one of them is about power. Who has it? You know, who's going to end up in the end with it? And every character in their scenes with Kevin, you never know how it's going back and forth. You know, when you adapted it from the play, you know, was it that way or did you add more to it? Um, a good chunk of that was in it, and then it was about pushing it further. So as I said, thematically, it was always about expanding it. You know, the play was just two locations. The ending was radically different. There was no sister character. The principal wasn't in it. None of his friends showed up. So a lot of these were things that were implied. And the goal with the movie was to dramatize that. Um, and as you said, it is about power. It's about power, about privilege, about the systems of power that exist and how we all actively and uh, subconsciously participate in those systems. Um, and ultimately, what was just so fascinating about it for me was that question of, well, there's a promise that this country is supposed to have of equality uh, for every individual, regardless of where you're coming from, and there's a reality of it. And that system of power and privilege uh, shapes who gets full access to humanity and, and, and who truly gets to be American. It's a conversation we're having every day in this country right now, considering A, who's president, and B, what we see in the news uh, and what continues to happen. And, and it just felt so vital and important to me to tell the story in a way that was about questions and not about trying to be prescriptive or didactic or give people answers to questions I can't answer myself or that you know, JC feels he can't answer either. Calvin, you know, you've been on a number of TV shows and films, you know, but for this, this is a lead role. Obviously, you're pretty much on every page with different actors. How is it for you knowing you have to put on different emotions, each character in every scene? 
Um, it was tough, but it, it, it just came down to the, one of the first things, I mean, I, I went to the Sundance Last for Monsters and Men that summer, and I saw Octavia, and she was the acting mentor, and she just gave us a lot of, like, you know, tips and things to think about, you know, as actors, and how to lead a movie, and how to walk on set, and I was just like, you don't know, I'm auditioning for the movie that you're attached to. <laughs> 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 and so it was like, I was taking all of it in, and I was like, okay, cool, like, and how do I interact with her? But it was just watching her, and, and, and Naomi, and, and Tim, and seeing how they carried themselves, and how they prepared, and one of the first things me and Naomi did was read the play, and it was cool to kind of see her acting coach there, and reading the source material, and breaking that down, and just just doing the homework it really comes down to the just the basics of acting and doing the work and that's that's all it, that's all it was and asking the questions and work i mean julius was so nice too he he just knows what he wants and that's such a rare thing to have with the director you know you mentioned earlier obviously you had different takes with jc you know even though you said the core structure of the play was in it but why go back and forth um, because he and I are coming from different experiences, A, eh? and uh, I wanted to honor, as I said, what was coming from the play, but then also to take it cinematically in terms of the direction I go, but it's also a hard thing to write. I mean, like, it, it was almost like math to a certain degree. Um, uh, when you're shifting from all these point of views, but you want it to be coherent and you want to make sure the questions that are being asked are being asked in a way that's clear, but never tipping the balance too much in one direction or another, it's very easy um, to, to, to kind of screw something like this up. So we, we, we were a good check and balance with each other, and, um, uh, and he's just a really fun person to work with. You know, when you're adding these extra characters, it's not part of the play when you're talking about uh, Astra, who plays you know, the basketball friend, and then you talk about the principal. Um, and then there's the sister. How do you add those characters in and then make them part of the plot as opposed to like side pieces? Well, it starts with knowing who your main characters are. So that's Luce and Amy and Peter and, and Harriet and understanding where they're coming from, what their point of view is, what the code is that they live by. And each one of these people has a code that they live by. Um, and then trying to think what creates a tension with that. So, you know, with Luce and Deshaun, there's a real duality. One person is the perfect symbol of an idealized young black man and one has the image of the delinquent that easily gets ascribed. So they're both put in boxes. Likewise with Harriet and her sister. Right? I mean, Harriet is a loose, essentially, in terms of coming from the South and being a product of a different time and era and kind of the, 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 the politics of, of, of you know, civil rights and, and kind of a respectability politics as well. And you see how she's been lifted and her sister hasn't and confirms, conf actually uh, confirms another stereotype of blackness. Um, so it was always about doing things like that where you know where your main character is coming from and, and the theme and the code. Um, and then thinking, well, what puts attention against that? Um, and then that way, it's, you know, it's organic. Kevin, you know, when you do a movie like this, and obviously you take these roles and it's a lead for, what do you learn after, it's, after you've done this? What do you learn from the character, from the experience of this film that you can take on to so another project? Um, I mean, every time it's different. Um, with Luce was, I, when I when I first read the script, I always thought of myself as more of a Corey. Like I was in high school, I was like I was like I'll never be that guy. I'll never be that smart. I'll never be you know a valedictorian. You know what I mean? I just would never be that. And and, and to kind of have to put myself in the shoes and the mindset of Luce, and then read the source materials that like Julius gave me, which was the, you know Rick Franz Fan and like Wretched of the Earth and Black Skin White Mask. I was educating myself. I was learning more about the world ar around me. I was learning more about other people's perspectives, and I was learning how to basically be a, a young black person and, and that felt empowered to say what he felt and and know what I want and speak on that and just kind of fight. And I think that was the biggest takeaway from it all. Um, was just being a little, just being a little more sure of, of myself, as I'm not doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the music adds to a little bit of the uh, the area of the movie, like especially when it ends. It's almost like that Hitchcock, like you know, at, as it ends. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I was very fortunate to work with two composers who I love dearly, um, Ben Salisbury and Jeff Barrow. Uh, ben actually comes from a background doing Discovery Channel nature documentaries, <laughs> and and um, uh, and Jeff was a member of Portishead, 
He's a member of Portishead. Um, and they've done some really fantastic scores together for Ex Machina, Annihilation, a bunch of really cool movies. Um, and I sent them the script, and, and they got it on the first bounce. And the only thing that was different was, you know, for a lot of movies, you, you cut the movie with temp music, and then you give it to the composers. And oftentimes, they're chasing the temp because it sets a mood or a tone. And I wanted to go the opposite direction. And I said, guys, I'm not giving it drove them crazy. I'm like, you're not going to see anything until you give me the themes. So they gave me the, the, the organ theme, and then they gave me the, um, the, the kind of the percussive jungle theme, because I was listening to a lot of jungle music when I was writing. Uh, that was fun. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and like they just nailed it. But what was great was it was coming purely from them. They weren't chasing anything. Um, and then I cut with that music. And then from there, they obviously kind of reworked things and reshaped things. But they had a really clear understanding of what the movie was, which was why I wanted to work with them from the very beginning. And much like what we were trying to do with the storytelling, it's not a didactic score. It's not, there's no point where the music swells and we push it to somebody's face and it's like, feel this thing. Um, it was really about complementing the storytelling and, and helping uh, uh, push forward that sense of ambiguity and complexity and, and messiness and some of the scariness of it too. Naomi's character is, is the, you know, the tip of the scale. You, know, you don't know where she's going to go until it hits midway. You know, um, can you talk about how you worked with Naomi in just constructing that character to know, I don't know if she read it from the get-go, to say, okay, now it changes. Um, it always was coming from a place of being honest. I mean, Amy is somebody who professes the right kind of liberal values that I think a lot of us want to profess in terms of how we view each other and other people and how we treat other people. And it was about staying honest to that. But, you know, Naomi is so incredible because she's fucking thorough as hell. So, you know, she was like, give me white papers on adoptions. Give me everything. Like, the amount of homework she did and thinking about who this woman was. Um, you, at the end of the day, your job as a director when it comes to cast is to cast the right people. And half your, you know, well, I was thinking about the question you just asked, well, what was the takeaway? Like, for me, I'm like, always cast the right people, you know? So having Calvin and having Tim Roth and having Octavia Spencer and having Naomi, these are people who are world-class actors because they're never going to lie. They're always going to try and find a way to tell the truth of the moment and of the scene and of the story. Um, uh, so it was always about, okay, what's the truthful thing? And that was really the process of working with her. But we did do about a week and a half of, you know, some light readings and staging a few things and also just a lot of talking. Um, and then there was the stuff that actors did without me. You know, obviously, uh, I'm assuming that, you know, you did some screenings early and you saw people's reactions, but what do you want this audience to get out of it? Well, again, it's a movie that's asking questions. It's really, I, I can't keep on, one of the things that made me want to make this movie the very moment I did, because I've, I've been wanting to do it for a while, but on the day of, of, of Trump's inauguration, I remember watching TV and seeing this image of you know, Barack Obama, America's first African-American president, handing over the keys to the White House to a guy who questioned his legitimacy as a president, as an American, as a human being. Um, and it just really made me think about, well, what is the gap between everything we claim we believe and what is the reality of, that exists? And how do our perceptions affect that, the ways we view each other? We want to think of ourselves as one thing, but we're not always the thing that we think we are. And that requires a real humility in terms of asking that question and standing outside of one's assumptions. And that's what I loved about the potential of this story. It's asking you to stand outside of your assumptions and what you think you know about another human being. And hopefully, if we start to have the kind of conversations that those questions start with, maybe we'll start to get beyond a lot of what's happening right now in this country, because I think there's a lot of work we have to do. And what about you, Sue? What do you think, you know, when you talk to your friends, you tell them you're in this movie, uh, what's this about? If they've seen it, what do you think they're going to get out of it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different form of director and an actor. <laughs> um... I haven't really thought about it yet, to be honest. I'm <laughs> not going to lie. All right. Where do we see you next then? Me? Yeah. Oh. Uh, am I, I don't know if I can say yet. He can't say, but he's got some really awesome stuff coming. Godfather yeah. of Harlem? Oh, well, that, yeah. well, yeah, I don't know when that's coming out, though. But <laughs> yeah, Godfather of Harlem is this TV show I did for Epics where I play like a Sam Cooke type dude, so it's cool. Okay. Anything coming up down the road? Uh, sleep. <laughs> a lot of sleep is coming up down the road, so. Well, that's all the time we have today because these Thank guys you have to guys go so to the much. draft house. <laughs>
Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>